Mr. President, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, I should tell you from the very beginning that any kind of technology or electronics I touch breaks down. As you can see, I haven't yet got this mic on, and it will work tonight, but usually I get in a London taxi, it breaks down. I get in a hotel elevator, it breaks down. I open a laptop, as my wife would tell you, it breaks down. So I promise you that tonight everything is going to be fine. We shall see. You know, there was a time until about a year or two ago when I could give a lecture with a certain amount of confidence, and I would say, this is what I think is happening in the Middle East. This is what I think might happen, though my crystal ball was broken many years ago. But over the last year, particularly quite recently in a coast-to-coast -coast tour in Canada, I found that events are moving at such speed in the Middle East. They're overtaking even my agile brain. I went to the Middle East when I was 29. My wife still insists I am 29. I believe it, but believe me, the speed of events is such now that I can't keep up. Sometimes in Canada, I turned and asked the audience if they could tell me what they thought was happening in the place I lived in, the Middle East. I may yet do that to you tonight. But I'll start on something very current. You know, in 2011, I never called it the Arab Spring. That was a nice Hollywood touch, and it was also untrue. I called it the Arab Awakening, partly because that was the title of George Antonius' fine book in the 1930s about the Palestinians. I've also come to call it the Arab revolutions, which, of course, is what they were. But one thing I noticed at the time, and didn't, of course, effectively promote in my newspaper headlines, was that the trade union movement probably represented in the Arab world the only secular force that existed. We weren't interested in it. We were interested in young revolutionaries, the overthrow of dictators, and then would the Muslims hijack the revolution? You remember these headlines. I fear even the Irish Times went in for that. My paper certainly did. <clears throat> and there was a major problem there because we forgot that trade union organizations, in many cases in the Arab world, represent the secularism, the division of state and church that we believe in, most of us. And I was very struck when after Mubarak had fallen, a young French reporter who's a friend of mine said, Robert, you should go to Mahala. You'll learn something there about the revolution. Now, Mahala is about 75 kilometers north of Cairo. It's a dirty, big, cotton-spinning factory city. Major export of Egypt, cotton. Very important for the regime. When I got to Mahala, I discovered that in 2006, we're talking years before 2011, the cotton spinning factory workers of Mahala staged a revolution. They called for the overthrow of Mubarak, they called for the end of the police state, better wages, and the freeing from detention of all protesters. Led by women who shamed the men into leaving the factories, the cotton workers of Mahala went to the central square of the town, which of course was called Tahrir Freedom Square again. And for nine days, they held off the security police. They held off the Baltagai, the thugs brought out of prison with drugs problems to beat them up. They got increased wages. They got better working conditions. They got detainees released. Alas, they didn't get rid of Mubarak. But they won in Mahala, the industrial workers of independent trade unions, not the government trade union, won. A big shock. They tried it again in 2008 and were savagely suppressed. In 2011, they were the first industrial workers to go to the Tahrir Square in Cairo to join the revolution against Mubarak. <clears throat> in other words, they were a mainstay of overthrowing the Mubarak regime. And of course, by extension, would be, unless they could be crushed again, a danger to any future regime if, quote, democracy didn't work. And so we find that today, for example, the trade union, individual trade unions still exist, but are very much repressed and arrested in Egypt. It's interesting, isn't it, for example, if you go back to 2011, that where there were strong trade unions in the Arab world, in Egypt, in Tunisia, Ben Ali allowed strong trade unions, there was much less bloodshed. Where the trade unions were concretized into the regime, Syria, Yemen, or were non-existent, Libya, there was massive bloodshed. I wrote an article at the time saying, I long to have a PhD student investigate what actually happened and the worth of these trade unions. There's something there we missed at the time because we were talking about Islam versus dictatorship and what was the West going to do and would it support the Muslim Brotherhood and so on and so forth.
And of course, <clears throat> my ears pricked up in the most terrible way when I heard of the fate of Giulio Reggiani, the Italian PhD student, Cambridge University, who went missing in February and nine days later was found by the motorway north of Cairo on the Alexandria Desert Road, badly tortured, his brain hemorrhaged, uh, electricity had been applied to his body, he'd been dead for several hours. The Italians pretty much believed that the Egyptian security police did it. Who else? The Egyptian security police claimed it could have been a road accident, the first road accident in which someone had been electrocuted before they were knocked down by a car. And I think the reason why Regeni was killed was quite simple. He had picked on as a good student and a good journalist because he was writing for El Manifesto, the Italian communist newspaper. He had picked on the one subject which most frightens the regime of Field Marshal President El Sisi. Not Islamism, it's easy to crush Muslims. It's easy to crush Muslim organizations. Lock them up, sentence them to hang, claim that they're ISIS, claim that they're Nusra, claim that they're Al-Qaeda, anything. <clears throat> But for an army to shoot down trade unionists is a much different question than an army prepared to shoot down bearded Islamists in the squares of Cairo. And I rather think that poor Giulio Reggiani picked the right subject and the wrong time for his PhD thesis. If you want to know my thoughts on it, I will only say to you now that as we speak, President Francois Hollande is in Cairo organizing a new arms deal with President Sisi worth $1 billion, perhaps because his arms deal with the Lebanese army worth $1 billion fell through and the Saudis refused to pay it. How long can we in the West go on leading two lives in the Middle East? A life in which we believe in human rights, which we read every report from Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, and yet we lower our flags when the king of Saudi Arabia dies, as David Cameron did in Britain, as indeed you did in Ireland. There's something wrong there. I come now to refugees. Again, I'm talking to, I don't like that phrase from the heart, I'm not sure journalists all have hearts, but I'm talking to you as things come into my mind by a kind of importance that leads down from those revolutions. What about those million refugees? You know, back in June, when the Greek elections were going on, I was up in Saloniki, in Thessalonica, in the north of Greece, and some friends of mine from Médecins Sans Frontières said, Robert, the real story is on the border, Idomini, the same place, the same Idomini, which is now crammed with thousands of <coughs> Syrian, Afghan, <coughs> excuse me, and Iraqi refugees. And what was interesting was that when I got to the border, thousands of Syrians were walking through the hot cornfields of northern Greece, and I was on the phone to my own paper saying, I think this is the story. <clears throat> and my foreign desk was saying, well, isn't it about how many people are still using ATM machines in Thessalonica? I said, no, no, I think this is it. I actually met two brothers from Aleppo, badly beaten by the Macedonian police as they tried to cross the border. This is June, before the big refugee crisis. And they said that, you know, they can never go back to Syria. They talked to Syria in the past tense. The UN claims that most refugee communities today, one third stay and the other two thirds will always ultimately return home. I don't think that's going to happen with these million refugees. But what did we do? Did we love them or did we fear them? Largely, we feared them. They were Muslims. They were coming to attack us. They were the foreign wave. We were as frightened of them as we were of our right wing political parties. And so we opposed them. Now we're even bribing the Turks with $3 billion to keep them back. I was interesting, interested to read last night, I was choosing a passage from a book to read on <clears throat> Irish radio later this week, and I was looking for a passage in Cecil Woodham Smith's wonderful original history of the Irish famine, the Great Hunger, and I found that even the people of Montreal in the 1840s and 1850s were trying to arrange institutions which would give return tickets to the Irish famine victims plus some money to make them go home to Ireland. It's not the same, I know, but it's the same system. You use money to get them to go away. But what did these re refugees represent? Let's imagine for a moment that they didn't come to Europe. Let's imagine that the million Muslim refugees went to Raqqa and Mosul because they said, our allegiance is with ISIS. Our allegiance is with the caliphate of al-Baghdadi. Our allegiance is with the hooded murderers. We want to be in the Islamic caliphate of Iraq and Syria. But they didn't do that, did they? Their failure to do so, their failure to go to the lands of ISIS for their refuge, 
was the biggest military, social, political defeat that ISIS has suffered since it first was created more than two years ago. And what did we do? We feared the refugees. If they had gone to Raqqa and Mosul and other ISIS-occupied towns of Iraq, including Fallujah and Syria, I could understand why we would fear them. Then we would wait for their suicide bombers. But they came to us. They didn't go to Raqqa. They took the train to Berlin, for heaven's sakes. They wanted to be with us. And we did not comprehend that. And now we fear them. Sure, I know, some ISIS people came with them. Of course they did. That passport left at the Bataclan, I'm sure that was deliberate. In other words, look, all these million people are terrorists. Terror, 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 terror. Of course ISIS would try to do that. But what society does not have terror and danger in the streets. Um, I can think of one city I can think of right now which had an innocent man shot down in broad daylight in the north side of the capital only a few days ago. Do you think that the Arab refugees, the Muslim refugees, don't have these people among them? Of course they do. But those refugees came to be with us. They did not go to ISIS. And that was the most optimistic thing that I've felt I've been able to report from the Middle East in many, many months. What was the movement of refugees to Europe? What did it really represent? Did it represent people saying, oh, <coughs> war at home, got to run away, go back later? As I said, these people spoke both in Arabic and in English of their countries in the past tense. Let's go back for a moment. Here goes Fisk into his history, Blarney again, to the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Sykes and Picot, the British and French diplomats, who effectively and secretly divided up the Middle East between France and Britain, the victors, as they were to be largely of the First World War, in secret during the First World War. France would get Lebanon, northern Iraq, that was the deal at the time, and Syria, Britain would get Palestine and Mesopotamia, now Iraq. And so keen on this plan were we that when the Americans first suggested that maybe there might be a good idea to have an Arab state running from the Atlantic coast of Morocco to the borders of Mesopotamia and Persia, Iraq and Iran, we turned it down. The Americans turned it down. President Wilson died, isolationism set in. The American State Department, <clears throat> represented by the former consuls to the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, and indeed NGOs, who of course were missionaries at the time, all pleaded with the Americans, a new Arab state, after all, had we not promised the kingdoms of the Gulf that we would give them Arab independence if they fought on our side against the Turkish Ottoman Empire, our promises again. I think, I suspect, again, you know, ask me to prove this, it would take a long time, but I think and I suspect after years I spent in the Middle East that the people of this region grew tired of Sykes-Picot. Because in those hundred years, they did not receive independence, they did not receive justice, and they did not receive dignity. Forget about democracy, I'll come to that later. They lived under our occupation forces. There was a huge revolution against British occupation in Iraq in the 1920s. Hundreds of British soldiers killed, thousands of Arabs killed, terrorists crossing the border from Syria, so the British government were informed. You're familiar with the story, it was restaged for you in 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. And during this period, we realized that we couldn't stay for financial reasons, so we brought in kings and we brought in generals. First of all, they were the kings in the Arabian Gulf, they've mostly survived. In other places, King Idris in Libya gave way to Colonel Gaddafi. Uh, King Farouk in Egypt gave way to Colonel Nasser. The colonels came in, but by and large, they worked for us, occasionally for the Russians, mostly for the West. And while they did so, the same repression, very often under the same repressive laws, and this was the case in Palestine, and as it became Israel and the occupied West Bank, it continued. These people continued to live under a form of occupation and injustice. You know, we're always going to the Middle East and promising people democracy. General uh, Maud, <coughs> who arrived in Baghdad in 1918, I paid $2,000 for his poster that he was stuck, he stuck on the walls of Baghdad, printed in English and Arabic, saying, to the people of the Mahafazat, the governorate of Baghdad, we come here not as conquerors, but as liberators to free you from generations of tyranny. Shukran Jazeelan, thank you very much, General Maud. And of course, the British army arrived and had to start putting down resistance and so on. And so, over and over again, what we do is we arrive in the Arab world and we promise them democracy and we arrive with our swords. Napoleon did just the same in Cairo. He was going to bring 
Cairo people free speech. Uh, General Moore in the First World War, we did the same in Palestine. And then, of course, we did the same in Afghanistan. And then we did the same in Iraq. And we always arrived with our swords and our horses and our M1, A1, Abrams tanks and our Bradley fighting armored vehicles and so on and so forth. And I don't think the Arabs believe this anymore. And they shouldn't. It was very significant that in the great demonstrations in Tahrir Square in 2011, I didn't see anyone holding a banner called Demokratia, democracy. They held up banners calling for justice and for dignity, which is not the same thing at all. Democracy for them was the description of the countries, us, which backed the Mubaraks and the Sadats and the Saddam Husseins, yes, from time to time, and the Assads, yes, again, from time to time. And we deleted this, and I suspect that what we've seen with these refugees coming to us is, in a way, their people, those people turning their back on the borders we built for them. And when they arrived in Europe, in Greece or in Italy, they turned their back on our borders as well. They decided they were going to go to Germany or Sweden or Holland, and they didn't stop at the border. They didn't care about our silly bits of barbed wire and our railway lines and our frontier stations. That we taught them at the time of Sykes-Picot. If their borders meant nothing, why should ours mean anything to them? I'm just trying to put into historical perspective as I see it on the ground, trying to avoid stories about ATM machines in Thessalonica, and realising that this massive movement of population represented one of the historical epics of our time, which deserved better than the leader of the Hungarians telling the world, including us, that he was defending Christendom, whatever that is. One of the first people to realize, I fear, that this was the end of Sykes-Picot was ISIS. Among the very first videotapes they put out, long before these wicked and obscene execution videos were published, brought out and put on websites, was a very crude video, which I saw in Beirut, it didn't get shown in Europe, of a bulldozer pushing down a sand berm, a revetment, a big hill of sand. That sand marked the border between Syria and Iraq. And as the bulldozer pushed it over, very crude camera work for ISIS, a camera moved down to a little piece of paper attached to a piece of wood in the sand, and written on it in English, of course, was, end of Sykes-Picot. That evening, we were going out to dinner with Walid Jumblat, the Druze leader in Lebanon. And those of you who know him will know this is a perfect imitation of him. He said, Robert, it's the end of Sykes-Picot! I said, Walid, Walid, take it easy. I mean, come on, it's just ISIS, a little piece of paper. No, it is the end of... And he was right. I suspect it was the end of Sykes-Picot, and ISIS probably spotted it. I entitled my talk to you today, after Life After ISIS, because, of course, there will be life after ISIS. Whether it's super ISIS, whether it's not ISIS at all, I think depends on whether we can start to think about a new Middle East. Not a Middle East of $1 million arms deals to President Sisi but a Middle East which involves education, in which we spend as much money on new universities, new schools, new colleges, as we spend on smart bombs. It depends on justice, not justice for the Palestinians, not just justice for the Kurds, but justice for all minorities, or in the case of Bahrain, for the Shiite majority too. The sort of, sort of justices that we insist on every day, whether it be in Dol Eren, the Shannad, British House of Parliament, the French Assemblée Nationale. Can we divert our attention away from television cartoons and military displays and smart bombs onto a real future for people in the Middle East. Because education, 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 my God, I sound like Tony Wretched Blair, but education, at the end of the day, will be what changes the Middle East, and justice, and dignity. And I've said many times, so there's nothing new in what I'm saying to you now, that, you know, some 10 years ago, for our Sunday magazine, a magazine and a newspaper, of course, that in print no longer exists. I worked out that we had, by the way, when I say we the West, I don't mean all you lovely, neutral Irish men and women. I'm talking about we the horrible West, you know, EU, America, Britain, France. We had more military personnel in the Muslim world than the Crusaders had in the 12th century. Why? What on earth were we doing there? This is not our land. By and large, those people are not of our same religion, if we still have religion in the West, which is a point I can come to later. They do not belong to us, 
We do not belong to them. If we wish to live in friendship with the Middle East, as we have for hundreds of years, you know, there was peace in Bosnia and Serbia for hundreds of years under the Ottomans. And under the Venetian states, the trade and the, and the technology, and over and above that, the classical learning that moved between the Arab world and the West was phenomenal. The idea that we're all in this permanent state of war is rubbish. But somehow, we've got to change the direction in which we look at the Middle East. We almost now, I was asked by a UCD postgraduate today, will we have to go on containing them for the next 20 years? Heavens above, what do we want to contain these people for? They didn't do us any harm. When 9-11 happened, my first reaction was, my goodness, it took a long time to that, for that to happen, didn't it? But let's go back to ISIS. ISIS, I think, understood all too well what happened in the Arab revolutions. It understood what people were beginning to learn about Sex Pico and the West. We cannot be trusted. We will not fulfill our promises. Their skies were crisscrossed with Western aircraft. In many cases flown, of course, by Arabs because they like flying our airplanes very much and using our tanks and our guns and so on. And our helicopters too. A few months ago, I was at Banff in Canada, lovely Rocky Mountains, lecturing to a large group of extremely wealthy um, Canadian and international businessmen, asset managers, bankers, the kind of people you would trust immediately with your lives and your money. <laughs> and <clears throat> I tried to explain to them what's actually going on in the Middle East. And I kept a little piece of this um, <coughs> amusing lecture. Well, it's amusing to me when I read it again this morning. I'm going to tell you, I was trying to explain to them what's actually happening in the military side in the Middle East at that time. We're talking about six, seven months ago now. How about this, I said to them. The Americans and the British and the Canadians, not anymore the Canadians, they pulled out, are bombing ISIS and Nusra in Iraq. Nusra, of course, is part of Al-Qaeda. The Americans and the British and the Canadians then are bombing ISIS and Nusra in Syria. We were going to bomb Bashar al-Assad's Syrian army in Syria, but we're now bombing his enemies, but not in such a way that it will help the Syrian army. The Syrian army is bombing and shelling ISIS and Nusra in Syria and all the other resistance groups. The Lebanese Hezbollah is fighting ISIS and Nusra in Syria and Iran is bombing ISIS and Nusra in Syria and in Iraq. So we are allies of Iran in Iraq and enemies of Iran in Syria. The Turks are bombing ISIS in Syria and the Kurds in Syria and Turkey. Meanwhile, the Jordanians and the Saudis and the Emiratis and the Qataris are also bombing ISIS in Iraq and sometimes in Syria, but not perhaps Nusra, which is part of Al-Qaeda and rather liked by Qatar. Meanwhile, the Saudis and the Emiratis are bombing Yemen and the Yemenis are shelling Saudi Arabia and the Egyptian Qataris are sometimes bombing Libya and the Israelis have been bombing the Syrian army and the Iranians in Syria, but not bombing ISIS or Nusra in Syria or anywhere else. And I finished that little paragraph to my financial guests at Banff by saying, ladies and gentlemen, I trust I make myself obscure. <laughs> this is our foreign policy in the Middle East. And do you think the refugees are not going to keep on coming? Let's go back again and maybe look at ISIS from a different direction. When ISIS first emerged, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington started describing it as apocalyptic. It's ridiculous. It's not apocalyptic. It's a cult. Apocalyptic. I mean, I keep saying to people, you know, this is not a movie. It's real. Stop looking at Tom Cruise. There's a problem out there in the Middle East. Look at it like grown-ups, not like cartoon movie addicts. Why don't we ever think of creating new institutions today? Let's go back to the aftermath of the First World War, when Sykes-Picot was beginning to take effect, but when Europe was swamped, here comes one of David Cameron's favorite phrases, with refugees. In this case, the refugees were coming from the collapsing Austro-Hungarian Empire, from the poverty of the post-war German, post-First World War German Empire. They were coming as the survivors of the million and a half Armenian Christians uh, who had been genocided by the Ottoman Turks in 1915. They were coming from Bolshevik Russia. The League of Nations was overwhelmed, but they had an idea. <clears throat> and they asked the great Arctic explorer, Norwegian, Freydhof Nansen, to find a way to create identities for the refugees. Not to treat them as a swarm, but to say, hold on a second, what is your name? To note it down and create new 
documentation for them. It was called the Nansen Passport. 53 countries in the end came to accept the Nansen Passport. It was given to refugees. Your photograph went there, of course, details from other documents you may have. Not that the Armenians left with any Turkish passports or Ottoman passports. But these documents became their new but real identities. Instead of being turned around at railway stations and by policemen wearing these endless... Why do policemen in Belgium and keep wearing these hoods and, and, and scarves? Incredible. It's fashion accessory they got from ISIS. But really, you know, these people didn't need to go through this grim turmoil in facing Europe. They could travel. They could come and see us. They could come to Ireland. The Nansen passport worked. But today, we don't have any such initiatives. We don't think... How many people here, be honest, have heard of the Nansen passport? Be honest and put your hands up. There's a few. I thought there would be. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ouch. Nine, Mr. President. Um, <laughs> ten. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <clears throat> that's not enough. But what I'm saying is, we don't plan for the future anymore. We have no long-term version of events. We just have fear and the 6 o'clock news. Or 6-1 in your case. Or the 7 o'clock news in New York. Press conferences. You know, what's on, what's on the app. For heaven's sake, this is not a way to do politics. When I went to see the Spanish battalion in Iraq just before they left, after the Madrid bombings, I'd been chatting to the soldiers. Yes, they wanted to leave. They were right. They got out of Kut very quickly and just in time. But as I was leaving the Spanish base, this giant man with a huge pistol, I'm from the agency, Bob, good to meet you, CIA, of course. What went wrong? He said to me, I said, well, you know, where do you start? I mean, it's already 2004. And so I said, well, you know, um, when you first arrived, you might have set up a big hospital in Baghdad and said, come all you poor and huddle masses, but you didn't do that. And then I said, perhaps we could look at what the Romans did. I wasn't recommending crucifixion. I was suggesting that um, the Romans, they saw everything outside their empire as being the barbar barbarian world. Barbarians, which is a Latin word, is what the Romans called the people outside their frontiers of civilization. We call them terrorists. But when the Romans occupied a territory, they made the people citizens of Rome. Now, we won't go too far down this line, because I can tell you that not far from Fallujah, a general, Roman general called Crassus fought the Parthian horsemen, the ancestors of today's Iraqis, who destroyed his legions. And when he was led into a tent to discuss surrender terms, they chopped off his head and sent it back to Rome. All that was missing was the videotape. But no, what I'm trying to point out to you, though, is that the Romans had an idea that what they conquered became theirs, and those people became theirs too, and were part of them, you see. Something we do not acknowledge in today's world. But they thought ahead. They had plans for their empire. I did suggest to this CIA guy that perhaps, you know, we should be giving free American British passports to Iraqis to show we love them. Because did we not come to free them from the tyranny of Saddam because we loved them? Not for the oil and the landmass and gas and so on. And of course, that was not something that um, commended itself to Mr. Blair or indeed to Mr. Bush. But at least the Romans had plans. Winston Churchill is not my favorite um, political leader in World War II. I did my PhD at Trinity on Irish neutrality, and I learned quite enough about Winston Churchill and his threats to Ireland. In 1941, before Hitler invaded the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941, when Britain still expected the Nazis to land on the beaches of Kent and Sussex, Churchill created a cabinet committee in Downing Street to organize the running by the Allies of post-war occupied defeated Nazi Germany. The next year, 1942, he opened, or Cambridge University opened a degree course for British civil servants. And when the Brits entered Cologne, which was the first West German city liberated, of course the Russians are coming in from the east, British civil servants in steel helmets went with the first British troops into the Rathaus, the town hall in Cologne, to set up local government. You see, we thought about it. We were way out there in front. When the first American troops crossed the Tigris River, and I watched them, they didn't even know what they were going to do tomorrow. There was no local government. Then they got rid of the Bath Party, then they got rid of the army, and there was nothing left. Back to ISIS. When the resistance began, 2004, 2005, when it started even as the Americans entered in 2003, we would go every day to the mortuaries to see how many dead people had been brought in. Assassination victims, collaborators, resistance men, people who had been murdered by one side or the other, shot down by the Americans, shot down by Iraqi soldiers, shot down by Brits. 
But after a while, when the figures reached 100 almost every day, the Americans gave instructions to the Ministry of Health in Baghdad not to put out statistics anymore. <clears throat> the statistics weren't fulfilling the narrative, which things were getting better, remember, year after year. <coughs> Excuse me. And so my colleagues and I started midday in the summer going to all the major mortuaries and counting the corpses in Baghdad. At the beginning, they were still coming in in the hundreds per week, sometimes more than a thousand in a week, just from Baghdad alone. Heaven knows if you added all the other Iraqi cities. It was in the tens of thousands in a month. Then women's bodies started to come in as well as men's. This was a new development. It took nine or ten months before this started to happen. Then bodies started to arrive without heads. Then heads started to arrive without bodies. One day, uh, a medical student, who's now a fully qualified Iraqi doctor, she said to me, Robert, they've just brought in a, a man's headless corpse and a dog's head has been sewn onto the corpse. And then she added horrifically, not very well. And I thought, something has, something has got loose here. This is not something I've seen before in the Middle East. It's not something in our experience of lifetime. I went one day to the big mosque, the main mosque in Fallujah. Then you could still go to Fallujah, because it's still today in ISIS hands. And there were a pile of, well, in those days we had VHS tapes. It was before DVDs and so on. And I bought a lot of these tapes thinking they were sermons, Muslim sermons. What were they saying? When I got them back to the hotel in Baghdad, they weren't Muslim sermons at all. They were film, a videotape, of Russian soldiers being beheaded by che bearded Chechen fighters in Chechnya. You could tell they were Russian because they had that blue and white um, sweater that Russian soldiers wear underneath their uniforms. And over and over again, a soldier would be led in, tried to cope with the pain, and his head would be cut off with a knife. And it, it dawned on me after less than an hour, just over an hour, that these were training films. They were teaching the people of Fallujah, or the Sunni resistance of Iraq, how to cut off heads, do so from behind. It's not as much blood. And that's when I realized that something quite different was taking place. A form of cruelty and hatred and anger that I had not experienced before. This possibly is when my world started speeding up at such velocity, I didn't quite understand it anymore. Now we move forward to the ISIS, which we recognize as being an institution, albeit terrible or apocalyptic in the ways of the Americans. What was interesting about ISIS is that when they started to show these carefully crafted, obscene videos of executions. They did so with immense care. The execution of, well, execution, the burning to death murder of the Jordanian pilot in a cage was filmed from seven different camera angles. Hollywood uses about five or six. When they filmed the drowning of, quote, collaborators, unquote, in a swimming pool, a nice suburban swimming pool with a diving board, who were lowered in the cage and then cameras, at least three cameras, under the water filmed their last gasp as they tried to breathe in, breathed in water and, and drown. These people were exercising the most extraordinary technological care to advertise their own war crimes. Even the Nazis in World War II and the Croatians in World War II, their photographs of war crimes were sometimes horrifyingly horrific, but they weren't well taken. They were not professionally made. And I began to wonder what it is about ISIS that in some strange way, it doesn't have feelings. If you read, and I'm not recommending this as your bi-weekly or bi-monthly uh, reading material, if you read their magazine, Dabik, which comes out online, they record and report rapes, enslavement of women, Yazidi Christian, merely with footnotes to certain hadith sayings of the prophet, which they claim uh, permit this or encourage this, sometimes even Quranic quotations at the bottom. But there's no, there's no emotion in it. Nobody said, this is a good thing for Islam. They said, well, we're following the word. This is what it says. This is what we're doing. I was struck by this more and more when I was covering Syria. Now, Syria is one of the worst covered wars ever in the Middle East, primarily because today we can only go to one side, unless you want to have your head chopped off on a video, preferably in a Guantanamo yellow orange suit. No reporter could now report from the ISIS Nusra side of the Syrian front line. So, of course, I go around Syria. With a, I, I can get a little bit into resistance territory, but only if it's the famous moderate uh, 70,000, as David Cameron tried to believe or make us believe. But by and large, I can't cross into ISIS territory. It's impossible. 
But where territory had been captured by Nusra or ISIS, I could sometimes go quickly in with the Syrian army when they recaptured this. I'm going to tell you about a place called Malula. Now, Malula was a Christian town, mostly Christian, partly Muslim. It had a church which is the oldest church in Syria. There are still, even today, Roman columns down the apse. The Syrians briefly recaptured Malula. Later they lost it again, by the way, so don't get carried away with the Syrian army. But I went in with them. And as soon as I got in, I wanted to see that church. Now, it, it was, it's a Greek Orthodox church, and it's the church of the Holy Mother, I think, in, in Arabic translated. And when I got there, I found that outside the church, I'd seen it before, there were mosaics of all the saints, Greek saints, of course, but St. Paul, St. John, and St. George and the dragon. And I discovered that Nusra, who was then the Al-Qaeda, partly, partly not linked to ISIS militia holding Malula, had taken a drill, obviously an electric drill, and drilled out the eyes of all the saints on the mosaics. Even the dragon. What had Nusra got against dragons, I asked myself. You know? And then I went into, I suppose you'd call it a lady chapel. Uh, I'm not sure what it would be in the Greek Orthodox Church, but the church, the little church next to the main apse. And there on the floor were piled heaps of torn up paintings, paintings of the saints, oil paintings. A Syrian army was still trying to defuse wires. The ISIS and Nusra have a very pleasant habit of leaving wires everywhere. And if you just touch one, goodbye. But I managed to get one of the strips of painting. Here it is. You can see it's an oil painting. You can see the saint's eyes. This is what I picked off the floor of Malula, more than a year ago now. <clears throat> now, audience participation. What do you notice strange about this? Quicker than that. Come on, as Paxman says on the University Challenge. Yes, got it, it's straight. It's interesting to have the idea, isn't it, that you know, someone comes along with a knife and a big beard and says, up, and slashes away at Christian paintings. They didn't, did they? Someone said, all right, destroy it, and it went in a shredding machine. They all did. Every bit of the paintings that I found were straight, perfectly geometrically cut, without any emotion at all. Outside the church, there were piles of Bibles, all smoldering still. Here's the New Testament in Arabic from the Malula church. As you can see, and I'm not responsible for cleaning up here afterwards, it continues to destroy itself, even as I show it to you. This is part of the Nusra ISIS way of dealing with the other side. I noticed that they were all burned in a pile. Nobody threw them around, no one ripped them to pieces. You can open the pages. It's in Arabic, of course, but you can still read part of it. ISIS had no emotions. They were, I thought then, and I still think, they have the emotions of an anti-aircraft missile or a helicopter gunship. They are a weapon. They're not apocalyptic, they're a weapon, just as we have weapons, tanks, uranium shells. They're a weapon. Whose weapon are they? <clears throat> Here I have to tell you that whenever I suggest that perhaps the Saudis might be behind, be behind ISIS, my newspaper receives from one of the most wealthiest solicitors in London a letter saying, I really shouldn't say that if I were you. So I'll tell you that everything that the Saudi, the Saudis don't have a constitution, but institutionally their Wahhabi Salafist beliefs are the same ideology as the Taliban, remember the Buddhas of Bamiya in Afghanistan, and ISIS believe in. If you go to the front lines in Syria, as I do, you know that the weapons being fired in the direction, for example, of the Syrian army, which was losing until the Russians came in, some of them are American, but they're paid for by the Gulf Arabs. This is part of what we are in helping to encourage, and that is the rejuvenation of the Sunni Shiite civil war across the Middle East Muslim world. Um, <clears throat> you know, I remember in Iraq, very early on, American spokesman was saying, someone in this country is trying to start a civil war. And I say, hang on a minute, I've never heard an Iraqi say that. What are we doing? I suspect that somewhere about a year ago, in Washington, it became realized that the Sunnis, the Saudis, the people who gave us 15 of the 19 hijackers of 9-11, that the Saudis, perhaps the Sunni people of the Middle East, were no longer our real allies. Perhaps it was the Iranians, the Shiites. And thus, suddenly, we had this wonderful nuclear agreement with the Iranians.
Suddenly the pressure on Lebanon to get rid of Hezbollah no longer comes from the Americans, it comes from the Saudis. <clears throat> As I said to you at the beginning of my talk to you tonight, I'm throwing things at you to see what you think of it because I can't, I, I am still not sure that I'm right, but I can see the waves moving on the water. And I think that the Sunni-Shiite divide is getting greater. Look, what is this war in Yemen about? Why are the Saudis bombing the Houthis and claiming the Iranians behind them? There isn't any evidence the Iranians behind the Houthi revolution. Shiites, the form of Shiism that they believe in. And so we go along with this. And all the time we emphasize the horror, the obscenity, the evil of ISIS. I think they're lost souls. How do you get a person to join ISIS? I was asked this today, I'm asked it all the time. Um, some time ago, a young woman in Avignon in France left her home. Parents went to the police, they feared she would go to, um, to Syria and marry an ISIS man. She did, couldn't get her back. Police asked a question, they found two Facebooks, one full of pictures of school, songs, friends, and the other Facebook had a picture of Aleppo, Bismillah Allah, Muhammad al Rasulullah. She wanted to risk and give her life if necessary for the women and children of Aleppo. Police asked, which was the real Facebook? Which was the real Facebook, ladies and gentlemen? Any ideas? I think they both were. I think they were both real. And I think there's something else about ISIS which has come up more and more. I noticed this the other day in a very interesting report in L'Humanité, the French Communist Party newspaper. I mentioned Al Manifesto, now I mentioned L'Humanité. This is very bad. I'm going to be a red by the end of this evening. But in the course of this, there was a very interesting moment in a Belgian court case when the head of the court said that one of the one of the strange things about this case is that these young men in front of me, who your, your, your fathers are here and your mothers are here in this court, they're talking to their mother as if they're 12 years old. The mummy at one point went out and bought some of their favourite chocolates, which they used to eat when they were children. They're in their teens, they've just come back from fighting in Syria. There is something which ISIS catches on to there, and I'm not certain what it is. But it is not a regression, but an infantile part, perhaps, that exists in all of us. I'm not sure. But there's something there. I'm giving you the clues which I spot. I cannot give you the answers, because I don't have them. Could we possibly do, could we do what ISIS do? Could we be the same kind of human beings? Or are they beyond lost souls? Have they moved into the evil bracket? Evil is basically a religious term. A couple of days ago, I was looking at Amin Malouf's wonderful book, The Arabs, the, the Crusades Through Arab Eyes. Amin Malouf is a Lebanese Christian Maronite, has won the top literary awards for fiction in France, wonderful writer, bit right wing, I know him. And he wrote this, in my mind, probably the most important book on the medieval Arab crusader world, The Crusades Through Arab Eyes. And here is a passage, page 39 if you get the paperback edition, where he was talking about the attack by the Crusaders on the town of Mara. Mara is just north of Homs, Homs and Hama, and is, well, it's now a ruin, of course, it's a Roman ruin, but it is in the hands of ISIS as we speak. In Mara, so said Radulf of Khan, our troops boiled pagan adults in cooking pots. They impaled children on spits and devoured them grilled. The inhabitants of towns and villages near Mara would never read this confession by the Frankish chronicler. The, the frange was the because they were mostly French, was the Arab word for the, for the Crusaders. The memory of these atrocities, preserved and transmitted by local poets and oral tradition in Arabic, shaped an image of the Crusades that would not easily fade. The chronicler Usama ibn Munkid, born in the neighboring city of Shazar, which no longer exists, but it's in Syria, the site is, three years before these events, would one day write, all those who were well informed about the Frange, the Crusaders, saw them as beasts superior in courage and fighting ardor, but in nothing else, just as animals are superior in strength and aggression. Did the Western invaders devour the inhabitants of the martyred city simply in order to survive? Their commanders said so in an official letter to the Pope the following year. A terrible famine racked the army in Marat and placed it in the cruel necessity of feeding itself upon the bodies of the Saracens, the Muslim armies, later to be the armies, of course, of Saladin. But the explanation seems unconvincing, for the inhabitants of Marat region witnessed behavior during that sinister winter that could not be accounted for by hunger. 
They saw, for example, fanatical crusaders, the Tafurs, roam through the countryside, openly proclaiming that they would chew the flesh of the Saracens and gathering around their nocturnal campfires to devour their prey. Were they cannibals out of necessity or out of fanaticism? This was written, remember, 20 years before ISIS existed. It all seems unreal, Malouf went on, and yet the evidence is overwhelming, not only in the facts described, but also in the morbid atmosphere it reflects. In this respect, one sentence by the Frankish chronicler Albert of Aix, who took part in the Battle of Marat, remains unequaled in its horror. Not only did our troops not shrink from eating dead Turks and Saracens, they ate dogs too! The dog again. You see, I suspect the Arabs who know our history very well know very well what we did in the past. I'm not saying it's all the fault of the Crusaders. I'm not saying it's the fault of the West. But our histories, when they have been peaceful too, but our histories are, are intermingled in such a way that they cannot be torn apart. We cannot separate ourselves from the Muslim world any more than they can from us. As I've always said, stop sending soldiers there. Withdraw all our armies and our soldiers from the Muslim world. Give them our agronomists, architects, teachers, educationalists, if they want them. Free. Money for universities. But stop going to war. The bad guys, as someone on CNN called it the other day, they want us to go to war with them. Al-Qaeda did. Bin Laden did. Bin Laden made it very clear to me when I spoke to him that he wanted to bring the Americans in, and he succeeded, courtesy of George Bush, and to some extent, I suppose, of... Tony Blair. If anyone can explain Tony Blair, by the way, you get 10 euros. <laughs> the guy had such close connections with God, God never gave him any advice. Like, you know, Tony, maybe this Iraq thing isn't such a good idea. But let me just, and I've read these quotations before in Ireland, but they impress me the more I read them because they sound like Joseph Conrad. Let me read now to you two quotations from an American Marine major, very close to Fallujah. These were written in 2005. They're letters home to his father. I have permission to read them to you. Both a sense of humor and an understanding of what really was going on in the Middle East. I want to read these to you, not because they're intrinsically funny, which in some cases I think they are, or intrinsically wise, which my God they are, or because they read like Joseph Conrad, which they certainly do, but because they show what you cannot read in your newspapers. This is the material you've never read in the New York Times. After all, he's an American. His name, by the way, is Bush, but mercifully, B-U-S-C-H. Major Bush writes home in 2005. So he's trying to set up local government in Iraq, around Fallujah. So what news about the new government, you may ask? Well, the provisional military governor was replaced by the transitional governor, who resigned under threat and was replaced with another transitional governor. He was then replaced by the, uh, by the emergency appointed governor, who has just been replaced by the selected governor chosen by the elected provincial council. He never made a speech or publicized his views, never debated the other candidates, and was not present during the selection, never making an acceptance speech. He was promptly, however, kidnapped by a rival tribe, while his tribe fought another tribe on the Syrian border. The recently displaced emergency appointed governor returned in hopes of regaining the position. However, the deputy governor is now serving as the acting governor, while the actual selected governor is in captivity. But there was an election, so democracy is in full bloom, I am to understand. <laughs> this is one of the American colonial soldiers speaking. Right? We are now trying to force the power of decision onto the elected provincial council and the city officials. It's a difficult thing to keep myself inactive in matters of governance here. This is the Imperial Army, right? The instinct to impose order and command the requisite discipline in the Iraqi leadership must be quelled in order to allow sovereign stewardship to develop at its native pace and in a native form. I fight myself to remain insignificant in the process. I haven't the nature for passive observation. I'm very American. I share the American fascination with action, and it has consistently betrayed us in our foreign policy. Our continued involvement will continue the state of dependency, and our eventual departure will leave nothing but cosmetic structure here. Our common sense is not common to this people, and that understanding must be given respect. I do my best, but I twitch with an urge for the folly of intrusion. Why can't we read work like that in our newspapers? Why is it confined to brave and intelligent and well-educated members 
of the American military. Here he is again, a little more serious this time, writing 25th of May 2005. He was wounded by an IED, stayed in Iraq, recovered and continued trying to set up local government. There is something culturally childish in that understanding of basic Western governance and management that will require immeasurable education and probably several generations to overcome if they find it of any interest. That education is, of course, a choice that they have to make on their own. They are not our people. Our understanding of their governance and its relationship to formal civic management is equally naive and charges our frustration. The problem now is that their every inconvenience has become our responsibility. They act as if they cannot comprehend our sacrifices and thus are ungrateful for them. Even though it is not their desire to offend, we are insulted and it bleeds us of affection and tolerance. Liberation will compete with invasion as our legacy, but locally we are ideologically irrelevant. Our presence is mostly only of interest to those who seek to benefit from our contracts and donations. That applies to Afghanistan, by the way. It's a region of people making alliances, business deals, friendships, enemies one day at a time. Our contributions may be counted long after we have withdrawn, but they will not recount the names of our dead. So many now. Our loss will have never even occurred to most people here. It's a pity that most American Western military people can't read those words. Bush has published a book, by the way, not with these extracts in. He's letting me publish these in my next book. But there you have, in a nutshell, from an American, exactly what I've been trying to tell you, much less eloquently, since I stood up to talk to you tonight. That's what's wrong. You can't do it. It doesn't work. We ought to leave. I've gone through before the reasons why I think we need to understand what causes these frictions that exist in the Middle East between them and us. And again, I'm not sure I'm right. And I'm going to say something I've said before in Ireland and other countries because it's no less true, I think, now than it was then. And that is that, by and large, in the Muslim world, people have kept their faith. Not terribly well, not always according to the standards of morality that they or we might wish, but they've kept their faith. They still believe in God. It is a part of their family, their life. In the West, largely, I think, not entirely, but largely, we've lost our faith. I know in the United States, I always get a lot of angry hands go up to point out that the Christians over there. Sure, I believe it. I know it. But by and large, perhaps because of the First World War, from which we all suffered, perhaps because of the Treaty of Vienna, perhaps because of human rights, um, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, the UN Security Council, we've come to believe in human rights as our God, not in God. And one of the questions that comes up from one side or the other, not, I have to say directly, and not in a way which I can specify and pin down all the time, but the question that comes up in conversation with Arabs and Muslims in particular, of course, is how is it that a people who kept their faith have come to be dominated physically, militarily, culturally, financially, economically, socially, by a people who have largely lost their faith? And I do not know the answer to that question. I don't know. I can't even be sure I'm asking the right question, but I think I'm near it. That must make people feel deeply humiliated in the most fundamental faith that they hold. Not just faith in family, but faith in God. Remember, the Muslim believes that the Quran contains the words of God himself. Not an interpretation, but the words of God himself, of course. The Shiites, you can discuss interpretation with the Sunnis, you can't. Here we go again. But that, I suspect, is the question that we all of us face, but do not admit. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in talking, listening to me tonight and letting me talk to you. Mr. President, thank you for coming. I much appreciate that on your 75th birthday. <laughs>